Okay, so we're going to have a time now for some reflection on what's happened this week. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Martindale and Dr. Yao. Where's Dr. Yao? Oh, right there. Uh, why don't you come up here for me, please, and Dr. Rowe. We, we, just, uh, we just gave you an honorary doctorate. There's a, yeah, come on up. And uh, what we're going to do is let you ask some questions, uh, make some comments. If you'll keep them relatively brief, and so you too up here, okay? So we, yeah. <laughs> Um, we're actually recording this. This doesn't uh, amplify, so we may have to repeat a question. I'm going to give it to uh, one of these fellows here in just a second. So who has the first question or comment to get us rolling? Uh, the the uh, subject is the whole world and everybody in it, um, <laughs> moving around, being religious, being not religious. So it's very narrow. So if you want to... <laughs> Help us to maybe narrow it a little bit more. What, what have you heard this week on immigration, Old Testament, um, all these different things that you want to just uh, hear a little bit more about or um, have a question? Somebody want to give it a try here? Steve. Okay. <laughs> Next question. No. Yeah. Next question. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, that's good. Which of you? Here, Paul. You can, yeah, you can just stay right there. David uh, Greenlee, who is a missiologist with OM, uh, wrote a book, um, Journey Along the Way. I can't remember the title exactly, but it's a wonderful study about conversion. And I think he may be the first person to publish this idea of uh, congruence theory that uh, basically when you present Islam as something very different to a Christian, it has a very high barrier and the person is very unlikely to consider Islam seriously. Vice versa, if you're a Christian presenting Christianity to a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Muslim, the more different that you make your presentation, the more difficult you've just made it for them in terms of considering it seriously and for conversion. So the lowest barrier in conversion is the more congruent your depiction of Christianity appears, the easier it is for someone not only to accept it or consider it seriously, but even to begin understanding it and dialoguing with you. So. Yeah, there are significant differences between, you know, Christianity and Islam, but uh, we shouldn't start with the things that uh, are the most different, according to uh, his um, theory of uh, congruence. We should uh, start with the things we can agree on, and of course, Miroslav Volf wrote that book, Allah, A Christian Response, doing that exact same thing and showing how that could be done um, so, anyone else want to, yeah. I, I just want to uh, point out that uh, this whole, di whole um, conversation of interreligious dialogue and ecumenical movement. Is this working? It, it, doesn't, uh, it, it just doesn't, doesn't broadcast. It doesn't oh, okay. All right. Oh, I thought, uh, I thought it's broadcasting. <laughs> 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 so this even make it harder. So, uh, I think this a whole conversation of ecumenical movement and really interreligious dialogue has to be uh, put in the context. Uh, it's originated probably and developed in the Western context. So for us, from Western context, we do not want to take it for granted when we come into the other context. 
See, uh, I would say in the Chinese context, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's a desirable, you see, this is a good thing and to reach out to other religious group and even the Catholic for the Protestant evangelicals. But you ask the Chinese Christians, they would say they would have a lot of reservation about that on the ground of theological, uh, uh, theological ground and, and also uh, political grounds. So, uh, um, you know, I would say that uh, Western church, the church in the West, is a sort of far ahead and may, may, not, may not be on the same page with the uh, with, uh, with, uh, Christian community in the other context. You know, you could turn to other ways, say, in other, probably in other context, uh, uh, say the different Christian group feel um, strongly about supporting each other under, say, pressure, under persecution, even strongly, even more strongly than the, than the Western uh, uh, counterparts. It's just a necessity for them to do so. Uh, that's not theological issues, and that's not something desirable. That's something they have to do. But in the other non-Western context, I would say, you know, the, for, for some local Christians, they will perceive this as something Western, the whole dialogue, the whole movement, and uh, not relevant in their context at all. So uh, my point is that we do not want to, um, we do not want to uh, conclude this is a whole dialogue and uh, ecumenical movement. Uh, it's relevant everywhere. We are not on the same page. Um, <clears throat> in some sense, I, 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 I kind of uh, agree that we do need some sort of interfaith dialogue on certain levels. But most of us who have been missionaries or on the mission field, uh, we're actually on the ground and we're almost seeing that there are competition. So uh, dialogue is okay at some point, but you know when we, we see, uh, when I came back to the U.S., I see all these bumper stickers with coexist and they got all these, you know, different religions. And that really works well in liberal, um, very peaceful communities where everything's already peaceful. So why not, why can't we get along? But try to bring that that message maybe to the Iraq uh, Christian persecution situation, you know, it, they won't have bumper stickers like that, you know. Uh, so, um, and I know in China, same thing, you know, the Chinese Christians, they're, they're not thinking about kind of dialoguing with the Buddhists and the, the Hindus, I mean the, the, the Muslims and so on. They're trying to convert China for Christ, you know, and that's, that's what we want to do. And, and of course, if it means um, some, some things that we can agree upon, Sure, but that's not going to be their main focus. Okay, let's uh, have another question. Yes. Okay, another simple question. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, we've got, Actually, yeah. I'd like Justin Shell to come up here. Yeah. Justin, please, would you come up here? When, when the questions get too tough, we'll just invite other people. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can explain what the traveling team does. I don't know. You'll explain how that answers her question, right? <laughs> is that right? So the traveling team is a mobilization ministry. 
if you were familiar with uh, maybe the Caleb Project, teams that traveled, and uh, the presentation looked different, but uh, modeled on the student volunteer movement of the traveling secretaries of the YMCA, the traveling team speaks on college campuses, particularly secular campuses, but to Christian groups like InterVarsity, Crew, Navigators, etc. And they present God's heart for the nations. And they invite students to then find their place in that, in God's heart for the nations. Uh, and one of their taglines is, we don't recruit to an organization, we recruit to a vision. Uh, and the vision is God's, God's vision for the nations. So is that, I may have been more generic than you wanted me to. <laughs> but uh, you were, in a sense, working for a group of um, mission organizations that were funding and supporting you. So in effect, it was an example of a project that was representing multiple mission agencies simultaneously. Every team, typically there were three teams traveling the U.S. at a time, speaking to about 240 meetings a year. Um, yeah, they would represent anywhere from six to ten different agencies. So each student that we met with one-on-one -on -one would hear what New Tribes is doing and what Frontiers is doing, what Wycliffe is doing, what team is doing. Um, and then the students could... They were really, for the first time, being exposed to different organizations, many of them. They, they were, there's not a missions conference at the University of Oklahoma, not a mission conference at USC. So these students were, were hearing about missions, some of them for the first time ever. Um, and they were hearing about several organizations at once. Good. Yeah, thank you very much. So I think that's one example. It's a small <laughs> example of the principle that we can really cooperate and work together. Uh, one thing that's been lost, I think, in the West is a mission organization is organized around a specific task for a specific time in a specific place. And when that um, task in that place is accomplished, well then that mission, in a sense, is completed. <clears throat> and rather than perpetuating the organization, renaming it, going to other places, um, you know, it would be really refreshing if some of us in mission agencies would actually say, ho hold a celebration and say, we've completed the vision and the mission that we start out, started out with in 1881, and we're closing our doors and we're going to turn the lights off we no longer need to exist around this particular task at this particular time. However, um, what mankind seems to do with the Spirit of God starts a movement and then we turn it into organizations and institutions. Uh, I think actually this generation may help us uh, in the history of missions to begin reversing that trend. And I look forward to that. I welcome that. So I also um, work for the Lausanne Movement, which is a, a platform of evangelical mission agencies and churches and denominations all coming together for a common vision. And so it is very hard to get different agencies and groups to work together, no doubt. Uh, in some sense, uh, working apart from each other actually is more effective because you don't have to deal with the cultural differences the, uh, and, and sometimes doing things separately uh, is actually good. Having 12 agencies here all with some, some similarities but some differences are, are good because you can focus and go further in certain areas. But uh, what the Lausanne movement can do is provide a general platform so we, when we look at a, a direction of let's say reaching China or reaching Tibet or whether it's uh, children at risk or diaspora, we bring the, the, the heads or the key leaders of that movement together to discuss how we can best do it with the different resources each agency has so that we don't duplicate or so can we, we collaborate or can we do things differently 
as an overall movement. And it's, it's still, there's a lot of competition and who gets to be invited to the table and so on, but that's, that's what the Lausanne movement has been able to do. One good thing I've seen in China though with, is uh, in China because of the communist government's uh, uh, um, more pressure on the church, it forces the church to want to partner together. Although it also uh, wants them to kind of separate because of security issues, but by having that common pressure or, uh, from the government, the churches now are saying we need to, we need to unite together uh, to do world missions. We cannot do world missions ourselves. And so not only do we need, you need to unite together within China, we need now to unite together with our brothers and sisters outside of China. So it'll be a global effort rather than just a Chinese effort. Okay, next, yeah. Very good. We in the back, Kyle. Um, what are uh, what do Christians in the West seem to be doing now to prepare ourselves to no longer be a supermajority or a majority at all in, uh, in the West? Exporting massive amounts of culture and oh no, that's not that's the wrong answer. Uh, you want me to take a shot for sure. while you sit quietly? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, actually, Lausanne. The WEA, the WCC with its realm, and the, the Vatican, uh, the Orthodox churches are all noticing the changing makeup of their own people. And uh, if they're good about it, and they tend to, tend to see this, they begin to highlight the, the, uh, you know, the beauty of this diversity and put people forward from other cultures and, and that sort of a thing. But we still need a, we still need a bigger shift uh, in this direction. Um, and, and when we were planning the Cape Town meeting, several people involved in this, um, I tried to highlight what the, I thought was the nature of the problem, which I think you're getting at too. Um, because they're saying, well, we could have an African group do a dance, and then we could do, have the, you know, the Latin Americans do something, and then I said, well, why don't we get the Americans up there to do a nice little drama and dance? And everybody was real quiet. And I said, you see, this, this isn't really the right way to think about this. Because you know, everybody's got something to offer. And it's not putting people on exhibit. It, it, what the, I said, the day that this finally shifts is when the Africans say, let's get an American group to get up there and sing a song. Uh, at our conference. Then things have shifted the other direction. But as long as it's kind of uh, putting people on exhibit, that's not, we're not there yet. And we aren't there yet. We're still struggling in that direction. So, but we're definitely making lots of progress and it's very encouraging. And the seminary here needs to see the same kind of thinking and shift uh, over time. Your question is a bit more general about what people in the West need to do to prepare, but I think that the church can help prepare the West and uh, be on the cutting edge of this. And um, in answer to a question that came up two days ago by the speaker, uh, Danny, he said, what's the end game <clears throat> in talking about immigration? Um, I think the end game is that every church should already now have as a goal of becoming authentically multicultural and multi-ethnic. Now for your ethnic, you know, Chinese, Korean, Greek, uh, Italian churches, uh, Song gave, I think, a, a, a great answer as to how that happens. It takes a couple of generations. However, I think that the uh, white Anglo-majority church, if they were intentional, 
they can actually do this faster, and I've actually seen some churches uh, in suburbs near a city where the city has kind of sprawled out around them. The face of their community changed, and they decided our white church no longer reflects our community. And they began intentionally changing. For instance, there was the first Nazarene church of Grand Rapids. And uh, they called a new pastor, but he stipulated several things. And one of them was they had to change the name to um, Grand Rapids International Fellowship. You want us to lose our first Nazarene status? <laughs> change our name? OK. A second thing he said is, you've got to take down all the kind of European uh, Anglo trappings and put up uh, tapestries from Indonesia and um, tile and different things so that anybody from any culture comes into this church and what they see on the walls, something there reflects their culture and identity and they feel that this is their home too. Then he um, hired an African-American woman to be the worship leader, and they changed the worship style uh, of the service. And then they very intentionally engaged with the community, and within 12 years, they went from being about 0% non-white to 45%. Um, he documented this in his uh, Doctor of Ministry thesis here at Gordon-Conwell. And there are a number of churches, and there are a lot of books now, actually, on becoming a healthy, multi-ethnic church. Uh, I think if churches in the West intentionally were making the church less vanilla and more intentionally multicultural, it would help us as a culture even. The church would actually be a pioneer and help all of us, in a sense, uh, make and adjust to this transition in a healthy, graceful way. And of course, it's a wonderful, rich um, thing to have this kind of diversity. So it's, a, it's not a negative thing. It's a very positive thing. So uh, I'm sure many of you who are in the your own mission agencies are even seeing the shift uh, from being a more Western uh, international agency that now includes a lot of more uh, non-Anglo, um, more diversity within your members, but also slowly uh, within the leadership of your agencies. And, and for example, OMF uh, International, of course, started in England, and, and of course, the North America and, and Canada uh, dominated in the past. Now we have about 40% of our members Asian and our, now our general director himself, Patrick Fung, is from Hong Kong. Uh, it still feels very international. It, it doesn't feel Chinese yet or, or Asian completely. When we're in conferences, it still feels like we're in a, uh, a, a less Chinese environment, but the, it's slowly changing. Uh, another great um, multi-ethnic uh, ministry that many of you we all know about is IFES, InterVarsity. Uh, it's, it's known very much to be very inclusive of minorities. And um, on the top level, on the international level, uh, Lindsey Brown, uh, who was the international director of Lausanne, whenever I was, we were in meetings together, Lindsey, even though he's a white male from the West, he is really a, a third world lead. He talks like a third world leader. So he almost embodies the African mindset or the, or the Latin America, or even the, he's never maybe even lived long term in those areas, but he's able to somehow give the impression that he speaks like and for them. And so he's constantly fighting within the Lausanne movement to get more and more of the majority leaders at, the, at each of the levels, from the top to the middle to the bottom. And, and, and you can just sense that this is a, a man who really believes in that. And I think that's why the Lazar movement is moving in that. Of course, there's many, we also need to include more women, we also need to include more younger people, and we also need to include more 
business folks uh, and working professionals and so on, but, but definitely if I, if I were to say the person who wants to get majority world leaders into the world Christian movement, IFES uh, with Lindsey Brown would be one of my heroes in that, in that direction. Well, as a theological educator, I see that uh, it's true that uh, numerically uh, you probably have more Christians living in the non-Western world today, but uh, in terms of the resources, or especially uh, theological educations, and uh, you know, and the global church is still, I think, still look up uh, at the West uh, for you know theological education, especially. So I don't see how this is going to change in the next, I don't know, decades or so. Yeah. And uh, so I would say the church in the West still have special responsibility, special role to play, especially in raising the next generation of leaders of leaders for global church. And, and also I would encourage church in the West to just pay attention to the opportunity and cross-culturally uh, mission, missionary reach out uh, at your doorstep. You know, even in the, in, the, in the North Shore, uh, other day I mentioned that, uh, in, you know, say, we have growing body of st uh, international students, Chinese students, at the Salem State University, you know, in the small corner of higher education in Massachusetts. Uh, you have opportunity right there. You know? And, uh, you know, and, uh, yeah, and, you know, with a tremendous church, and let's like say take China uh, for instance, and you know you have a tremendous growth of the church, and but you still have the Chinese church send their best people to study here, right? Yeah, just ask the Koreans, just ask the Korean students why they are here. Okay. Actually, can I say one more thing here? Um, sorry. Uh, <coughs> There, there's a book that uh, Paul Borthwick wrote uh, that addresses uh, uh, what can the West uh, contribute to the global church. And actually, uh, he actually asked for my, some of my input. And I actually, because most people kind of like to bash the, the, the West, but I really think there's so much that the West can offer. In fact, um, uh, something like a Gordon Conwell, still we cannot see that in, in, in the in majority world yet. The resources of theological depth, the resources of biblical training, um, and the, f the finance and, and, and money that goes behind all this, the engine behind that. You know, Asians can lead Asians, uh, Africans can lead Africans, Latin American men can lead, but very few people can lead a global movement. And the Lausanne movement, like, you know, is Doug Birdsall, Lindsey Brown, Blair Carlson, to get everyone together, some t you, you need money. I mean, it was $16 million to get the Cape Town Congress, and it's very hard for uh, the majority world to come with that kind of resources to make that happen. So, so, so behind that is, is really the West partnering together in a, in a global movement. Okay, did we have a question up here? Yeah. yeah. Mine may be, be bumped up. Uh, what is your feeling for not going to the mission board and going just as a person. Since today, almost every country is crazy about learning English. And if you would you, they almost go there and get a job just like that. And then when you get there, you connect to whatever, you know, whatever group that you feel best um, you could go to. Yeah. So so numbers of uh, uh, what they used to call tent-making missionaries or even just people going, uh, Christians going about their business in other countries of the world, teaching, uh, doing a number of things as, as their way of getting in contact with people around the world. Uh, mission agencies 20 years ago were very nervous about this kind of thing. And I think uh, most agencies have seen that this is really part of, of what migration is all about, that there's, a, there's an employment side of it, and that it can have a very positive impact on the spread of the gospel, and that it, there isn't just one way to go about this. So, so I think actually that it is, it's very important. It, it increases the amount of contact that people have at different levels 
places missionaries can't go, where people are working in companies in, in Japan and other places are very significant. Good, good for them. Yeah, that's a very good point. And we should maybe bring up, I'll, I'll just mention one other thing, goes back to cooperation. You know, there's 5,000 mission agencies in the world, and there's t 10 more tomorrow. So <laughs> they're, growing, they're growing pretty fast. But uh, when, I go, when I go and give a little talk at churches, I think many of you had noticed this, you go to the board that shows where all the missionaries are and who they're sent with, invariably, um, there's people who are just going on their own, and they're not always in business. Sometimes they're sent by the churches directly. Um, and again, the, the mission agency is very nervous about this 20, 25 years ago, but it's a reality. And in fact, our statistics about missionaries look different than official mission agency statistics because we think people who have gone out directly and have been in Siberia for 25 years, like some friends of mine, they count. They're, just the fact that they're not listed in anybody's mission agency doesn't mean they're not missionaries. Mm -hmm. So there's something new going on in between, too, in between the agencies and business and, and all of that. So, and um, these people in the middle have made a lot of mistakes, but of course all the agencies did as well in getting started and so on. So I think, you know, that, that's another area where we've seen you know, no one gave them permission, but they went anyway, and some, some out of great courage in, in, in this situation. So, anybody else on that? Good. Okay, so, yeah. Actually, the Chinese church uh, is probably going to be sending missionaries very much so more like that because they, uh, they're going to send missionaries through tent making and through, the, uh, you know, going around the world where they move. So definitely the, there's going to be different models of missions. The Korean church has a vision by the year 2030 to send out 100,000 full-time career, you know, calling career missionaries, but they have a vision to send a million tent makers. So, so they're saying that as together, we, we need both. And I mean, I've been on mission field for myself uh, for close to nine, 10 years in, in China. And uh, the danger though is to say, Everyone goes tent makers and, and, and forget the, the career missionaries. But the, there is a value of going with a mission agency for a mission agency reps here. Let me just say that. It, uh, 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 because um, uh, I'll, I'll just tell you really practically on ground. So I, I have many people coming through Beijing who are missional in their own calling, but they're not with an agency and they come and they try to teach English and learn language. But when the going gets tough, um, very much so, they, they're, they're back in their home, or, or the, the career takes them somewhere else, and then God plants seeds for, uh, for a season. But the career missionary often uh, is called there, and when the going gets tough, of course people do leave. We're there to, uh, to stick it out, you know, and, um, and there's a different kind of presence with that kind of a, a, of a mission work. So. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Uh, you want to just ask? Yeah. Go ahead. I'm Steve, and I'm proud and grateful to be a Westerner. Mm -hmm. I work with a ministry called Create International, which is a uh, very small ministry under the very large umbrella of Youth with a Mission, which is extraordinarily uh, diverse and all over the world. And In our little ministry, under YWAM, there's probably between 60 and 70 adults that are serving with the ministry in seven different locations. I would say, without you know really having done the math, that maybe only half of them are Westerners. And that's because for some reason we've attracted a lot of Canadian Mennonites, uh, not Western. Uh, I don't know why, but we get a lot of Canadians. So if you're a Canadian, 
So that means really the other half of them are really coming from other countries. You know, I've, I've been serving with people from uh, Egypt and Brazil and India. Uh, I just worked with a young woman from Bangladesh. Uh, so that's um, really beautiful to see that this, uh, you know, the church really is growing and coming up from the South. And, uh, and I, I see the evidence in my line of work of, uh, of what Todd Johnson's um, Atlas has uh, Well, I'm glad this isn't much of a hot button or sensitive topic. Um, in some places where the church is emerging, uh, they will not have uh, neither, in a sense, the mentality of supporting uh, and sending people out, but their economy may be uh, very weak and unable to uh, help, and so it can be uh, something that happens um, over more than one generation. Uh, one of the things that we taught the churches we were planting in North Africa was that uh, God had blessed them with resources and that um, regardless of how much it was, um, they had a responsibility to the rest of the world. And I remember thinking uh, one day after about seven or eight years uh, that the church, the little house church, all former Muslims, uh, they had heard about a need down in Senegal, and they decided to take up a collection and send money uh, to do a relief project in Senegal. And I'm thinking to myself, now this is the sign of the church emerging and maturing and seeing its place. And, um, you know, there, there, this is a very large topic. Um, partnership needs to be between equals when one has more authority you know and one has less authority there's hard feeling when one has more money and the other has less there can be dependency so it's a minefield for um, making good cooperation but you have to uh, understand uh, what is partnership if God brings us together with someone from Rwanda they have things that we don't have to contribute. We have things they don't have, and we should be sharing. Now, it, I know from personal experience in 18 years uh, in North Africa, um, money creates all kinds of uh, issues. And um, I don't want to give even a well-qualified answer, you know, as a generalization. Um, and many of you have experience as well in your ministries, uh, I'm sure. Um, 
It's something that we need to take seriously and work through, and we just need to realize that um, when God brings us into partnership with other people, um, they have something that we have that we don't have. We have something they don't have. We should be equal in terms of uh, how decisions are taken, and God uh, will provide the resources. Sometimes we have to get creative in a poor country, but usually the resources in that country exist to be able to meet the needs. And uh, instead of just defaulting back to you know, donors in the West, I think we need to be more patient than that and, and be more creative. And then what happens is the local church, instead of having their authority undermined, they are built up and they become mature and they take their role. Um, so that's, that's a huge question. That's a small answer. Uh, anyone? <laughs> I, can, I want to get more questions. Okay, we have time for just a couple more questions and I want to give you a chance. So, yes, Christine? Yeah, that, that excellent question. And I think it would be good in light of what was said earlier to, to um, frame this in a slightly different manner because there's something called, uh, um, what is it called? Well, it doesn't have to be called anything. There's, there's, <laughs> there's a movement to get away from previous patterns in interreligious dialogue. The previous pattern was to look for the lowest common denominator of good uh, between groups and try to rally around that. And usually the people that did that were actually the weakest oftentimes in their own faith community. What's new is that strong members of faith communities are now getting together and like, my, like me and my friends in the Jewish and Muslim community, these are not weak members. These are strong members. That dinner I went to, this was, you know, there, there was blessings and there was the presence of, of many, many um, Jewish rituals and everything. I mean, it was, it was strong, not weak. And, and that's one of the things that's exciting is now stronger believers are getting together and they're not looking for the least common denominator, but they are looking for things that, that uh, we have in common that we can work together, but there's not a hint that there's some kind of melding together uh, of, of uh, weak elements within the religions or that they're all the same. And I think that's very encouraging. I think it's an open door for evangelicals to get involved in what previously, you know, it didn't look very appealing to go and, and to sort of give up who you are in order to be at the table. Now there's a strong what one writer calls strong benevolent. Because what, what he says is on one side we used to have strong and hostile, on the other side weak and tolerant. But now there's a new middle being carved out in, in between religions which he calls strong benevolent. Which is I think where this is all, where this uh, is, is exciting. And that is a very good question because we do not want to give up uh, our, our unique uh, features of, of evangelicalism within Christianity or certainly Christianity within the rest of the world's religions. And maybe I should say that this also unexpectedly opens doors in a completely new area and that is let's say evangelical atheist relations which are at an all-time low in many ways. Um, this is a new open door in that field too and I've been able to participate in that to a certain degree um, because Certain people are trying to define the rules of, of that relationship, and, and they don't have it right. Um, we still need that benevolence that is part of who we are, and it's one of our great, weak, our, our great witnesses as, as evangelicals, uh, that we actually kind of look like Christ in what we're doing. So um, I think that's, that's encouraging. Anybody else? On? I see a strong, hostile look. No, I don't. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, no, I don't. Okay, an another question. Well, just maybe one more, because we want to get you out by t uh, 1.30. Yeah. I think I might hit another hot button. But, um, okay, time's up. <laughs> Okay, yeah, another tough question. Uh, yeah. um, our International Lausanne meeting was held in, 2000 and, in, in 2009, I think. It was, it was in Argentina, and it was actually, we had a cardinal at our meeting about this size. This is the international leaders to come give the devotional, and you know who, you know who that cardinal was? It's the current pope. And so uh, the pope has a very good relationship with evangelical leaders. In fact, the, the international deputy director for Lausanne for Latin America uh, is uh, at the time uh, Norberto uh, and the pope, the current pope, would, before he was a pope, would get together on a monthly prayer meeting of, of, of evangelicals and Catholic, Roman Catholic priests in the city. So there, this is a, a you, you see evangelicals and Catholics on that level having that kind of a a relationship. No doubt they're still um, seeing each other as competitors in the region, right? But they still see each other as brothers in Christ and are, are praying with one another. So I, I think we are going to see a, a resurgence of Catholicism realizing they're actually learning uh, from the evangelicals of the loss of evangelism, you know, and, and actually the heart for the poor. So they're, they're actually saying, wow, see what they have done what we have lost, and so maybe we need to do that ourselves, and so that might be a good thing, not a not a bad thing, uh, for the for the it's church. Not necessary to do either, but yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they're doing heavenly yeah. So actually, when uh, the the when he left for the uh, for the Vatican, uh, he did uh, uh, call up uh, Norberto, and they, they they had a prayer together before that, because there was a likely chance he wouldn't come back, which was true in the end, and he became the pope. Wow. <laughs> Okay, I want to thank all of you for coming. It was, it's great to be here with you, and especially our mission reps who are peppered throughout the groups here. Thank you.